Kamala Harris pledges full support for Israel as she accepts the Democratic Party nomination. A prominent Muslim group has withdrawn its support for her. Harris has promised a new way forward for the US. But what are her chances of becoming America's first female president? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm James Bays. It was a historic moment in American politics. Kamala Harris, the daughter of immigrants from Jamaica and India, became the first black woman and the first person of South Asian descent to accept a major party's presidential nomination. If elected, she'd be the first female president of the United States. At the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, Harris promised to be a leader for all Americans. She also called for a ceasefire in Gaza while saying she stands up for Israel's right to defend itself. But how would she be different from Biden? Why she not achieved her policy proposals as vice president? And can she beat Trump? We'll discuss all of this with our guests in a moment. But first, this report from Victoria Gatenby. After four years in President Joe Biden's shadow, this was an opportunity for Kamala Harris to appeal to an audience of millions, to set out her personal story and her vision for the country. Portraying herself as the embodiment of the American dream, Harris promised voters she would restore hope and prosperity. She said she would reform America's broken immigration system by signing into law a bipartisan border security bill and cautioned against what she sees as the dangers of a second Donald Trump administration. Harris also condemned the October 7th attack and called the humanitarian crisis caused by Israel's war on Gaza devastating. Some shouted free Palestine as she spoke. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. Outside the convention, many Palestinian supporters who came to Chicago to protest against Israel's war on Gaza were left disappointed by Harris and the Democratic Party. No Palestinian American was given the chance to address the Democratic National Convention, a group that had been campaigning for the Democrats known as Muslim Women for Harris pulled its support in response. I watched somebody from my state who was an anti-choice Republican get time on that stage and not a single Palestinian suggested speaker. I want to be clear, this is not about me. We came here to offer a gift. We came here to offer an opportunity to bridge the gap between our party and our voters. Despite a long list of high-profile speakers at the four-day-long convention, very few chose to mention Gaza. The family of captives held in Gaza were given a platform. After watching four days, it's sickening to see that there's literally a party happening inside the United Center that's coated in the blood of our people. Um, and the fact that the Democratic Party is trying to escape the fact that they are responsible for genocide uh, is beyond words to me. Harris promised to be a leader for all Americans, but many Arab Americans say they feel ignored. They are a crucial voting bloc in several swing states, and whether they turn out to vote could decide the result of November's election. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our panel of guests to discuss this further. They're all joining us today from the United States in Washington, D.C. Mark Fifley, the founder of Off the Record Strategies, a public relations company. And he's also a former advisor to President George W. Bush. In New York, John Zogby is an American pollster, author and founder of John Zogby Strategies. And also in Washington, D.C., Tarek Habash, a human rights activist and the first political appointee to publicly resign from President Joe Biden's administration over its policy stance on Gaza. Thank you, all of you, for joining us. Uh, let me start with you, John, just to summarise this week uh, in Chicago of the Democratic Convention. Kamala Harris will be happy with the way it went, won't she? 
Oh, she sure should be. Um, she extended her honeymoon period a, a full week, and she did essentially what she had to do. You know, not expecting ever really to be the presidential nominee, the tall order was to bring Democrats back, those who were, uh, you know, disturbed, disappointed in, in President Biden and uh, were giving Biden an, uh, a, a, a low score in terms of his favorability. So she helped to unify the party, at least thus far and for the most part bringing back blacks, this is according to the polling, bringing back more Latinos, bringing back more younger voters, particularly younger women. So today she should be feeling pretty good. And she better be because um, the, the campaign is truly engaged starting today with the president uh, in, uh, in Arizona. Mark, you're the Republican on our panel. It's been a very uh, amazing few weeks, would you not say, in US uh, politics. That debate, which eventually forced Joe Biden to pull out, the assassination <clears throat> attempt on President Trump. Some Republicans at the time thought they'd already won the election. And now it seems to comp have completely transformed. Would you accept that? I think it is. It's absolutely right. It is a roller coaster that it's been on uh, the last month and more. Uh, it, it, the, the interesting thing is that Democrats have been in charge of the White House for 12 of the last 16 years. But in this convention, for much of it, it was like as if this, these are the things we're going to change now if we get in charge now. So I think that the Democrats have to, uh, they, because of the right track, wrong, uh, right track, wrong track, more Americans think America is on the wrong track than on the right track, that they have to run a campaign that is what they want to do instead of what they have done. It'll be interesting to see if they can do that for another 70 plus days or if that catches up with them. And Trump has a chance to potentially uh, get even with uh, Harris and maybe take it down to the end very close once again. Tarek, you resigned uh, over Gaza uh, as part of the Biden administration. You are a supporter of the Democratic Party. You must have some somewhat mixed feelings about how things sit at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. On the one hand, it was an exciting energy throughout the convention all week. Um, I was there, I was on the ground, I was inside the United Center. A lot of people were excited about the vision that Vice President Harris has for America, particularly on domestic policy, when it comes to fighting for workers, when it comes to fighting for, uh, for women, when it comes to making sure that all people have an opportunity to succeed here in America. Unfortunately, I think that the speech last night, um, despite all of the positive energy, despite all of the great things that we heard, fell a little bit short when it came to recognizing the need to support Palestinians here at home, to bring an abrupt end to the ongoing violence that is falling onto Palestinian lives in Gaza. I think she did talk about it, but I do also think that we haven't seen a substantive shift in policy. I think that words are not enough. Palestinians are starving in Gaza. They can't eat the words of hope. And for possible change, they need to see action. And that just hasn't materialized. OK, I'd like to come back to the situation in Gaza and how it impacts the election later in our discussion. John, though, may I drill down? You're the pollster on the polls. Now, I've been looking that looks like the latest headline figures on nationwide polling put Harris about... 49 percent, Trump about 47. So it's still close. Yeah. And of course, in the US, mm -hmm. it's complicated for th those that don't follow US politics closely. It, there's the Electoral College. And so it doesn't really, those headline figures aren't the things to watch. It's the battleground states. Yes. How close is it still? Oh, it's very close. And, you know, for starters, that top line number nationwide, a Democrat, because of the way the votes are structured, Democrat really needs to be leading by three and a half to four points in order to win because she gets extra millions of votes from California, Illinois, and New York, where Democrats are, are heavy. But when we get down to the battleground states, it's very competitive. And what we see now is because of this honeymoon period, Harris is now leading in the states where she absolutely must lead, the, the northern wall um, uh, the blue wall uh, of, of Wisconsin, 
tied in Michigan, uh, tied in Pennsylvania, uh, but, uh, but Biden was behind. But now we also see her actually leading in Arizona with 11 electoral votes and getting very close in Georgia and in North Carolina, all of which is to suggest that um, despite, you know, the good feelings of, of this week, this race really is at equilibrium. And over the next 70 days or so, the leads are going to change back and forth, back and forth. Expect that. That's what happened in 2000 between Bush and Gore. That's what happened as well uh, in, in 2012. Uh, where uh, Obama ultimately uh, ended up uh, defeating uh, Romney uh, for re-election. But expect this to be a very close, closely fought race. And, and John, if you could just tell me, in terms of conventions, how much impact do they have on the race? How much of a bump do they give in the polls? Because I assume most of the audience for a convention are the ardent supporters of that party. Yeah, that's correct. Now, for starters, uh, we had good audiences for the convention. So 20, 21 million people watched. And yes, they were mainly supporters, but then those supporters went off and buzz, you know, and, and talked and talked to others. So there, the, the convention did what it was supposed to do. However, um, when push comes to shove, those voters who, you know, were largely undecided, uh, perhaps not even paying attention. That's where the focus now is for the next uh, couple of months. Mark, let's look at Donald Trump and how he is reacting to all of this. He seems to me not to have adapted to his new opponent. Um, he, he was there last night watching the speech. We know that because he was on his social media platform and he seemed to be doing some, some sort of instant rebuttal by posting 37 times during her tweet. But the first one of those posts was about Joe Biden's son. Where's Hunter? He seems to still be focusing on Joe Biden and has not honed his attack on what some would say are the weak areas for Harris, uh, things like inflation and the southern border. That's right. You know, Trump and his team have committed political malpractice. They should have known, as we all did, after President Biden's uh, performance at the first and only debate uh, between the two, that he was probably not going to last the long term on the ticket. They should have immediately put together a game plan for Harris or several other potential Democrats and launched that immediately. And then Trump as well, his challenge has been his entire political career since he rode down on the escalator to be disciplined and to run a campaign based on who your opponent is. He's tried to essentially run the same campaign since 2016, which is undisciplined, not focused, but doing kind of a riffing, a monologue on his rallies and hitting and complaining and really being all around kind of attacking. That same game plan is not necessarily going to work against Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. He has to focus, like you said, on inflation, on the southern border, on the international issues that are going on right now, which make people feel unstable and uneasy. That needs to be his focus for the next 70 days. And really, it's his ball. He can take it and run and actually make that happen. So far, as you said, with his many posts on his social media platforms, he's not done that. And one way a, a presidential candidate can get some help is with their with their vice presidential nominee, Tarek. J.D. Vance is, is the nominee for the Republicans to be vice president. The Democrats have branded the both, the pair of them, as weird. Uh, we had some very interesting pictures. Let me show you this. Vance did a photo opportunity uh, in Georgia. Um, he went into a donut shop and it was a very, very awkward scene. Uh, the lady serving him didn't want to be filmed and she didn't seem to care less that he was running to be the vice president. I mean, it's a little thing. Or do you think it's a symbol of a campaign in disarray? I, I, I do think it's a, a slight symbol of disarray. The reality is that J.D. Vance does not have very good favorability numbers. He's supposed to represent working Americans from, um, from Ohio, from Appalachia. And the reality is that he can't do a good job of that because of his history of advocating for billionaires and for wealthy people and being willing to 
shift on his opinions and his views and it makes him inauthentic. And so unfortunately he doesn't have the same kind of charisma and ability to connect with real Americans in the same way Tim Walls does. The convention speech, let's turn to that, uh, John. And, and, and a centerpiece of that was, a, she's a former prosecutor, uh, a loyally attack on Trump. Do you think that's what we might see when these two face each other in a debate? Oh, that's uh, made in Hollywood. Uh, uh, a leading prosecutor now running for president against a convicted criminal. Um, you know, that if it's not the centerpiece, then, you know, uh, call me. Uh, uh, but they certainly get it, that that is a, a major theme. And and it is a weakness. It may not be a weakness, you know, among them, the MAGA, the hardcore supporters of Donald Trump. But those are a given. And they'll vote for Donald Trump uh, as soon as they get a chance to. It is those undecided voters, those moderate, uh, those independent, those who haven't quite made up their minds yet. They had, uh, there, there are very few what we call double haters anymore, those who hated both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Th there is a perfect outlet now in the form of a, of a younger, a more joyful, a fresher uh, a candidate. And this fresh candidate happens to have a strong record as a strong prosecutor, and she will take advantage of it because she's running against someone who has a myriad of, uh, of, of criminal indictments against him. And Mark, convictions. The, Mark, the other thing, and, and, and it's worth noting that there, there's still, he's still got uh, legal hurdles coming up uh, before the election. It's due to be sentenced on the criminal hush money case in New York on September the 18th. Mark, going back to Harris's speech, um, an, another thing I think was noteworthy, she's talking about a new way forward. She's trying to portray herself as the change candidate. As a Republican, what do you think of that, given that she's been in this administration as the vice president? I, I think it's fairly brilliant. I think both that and capturing freedom as a word for Democrats, uh, it takes a lot of guts and and in a, in a bit of a suspension of disbelief because they have been in, in charge uh, for most of the past generation. The Democrats have been in the White House. But I, I think that it's smart, though, because she's talking about joy. She's talking about uh, positive uh, things. And Trump thus then comes across as kind of uh, nasty and mean. And so I think it's brilliant. And Trump is playing right into the hands of, of that. And, and, but, but I think that the, the challenge for Trump is he has to kind of change the way that he's campaigning. He has to change his rhetoric. He has to improve it. He needs to be more Ronald Reagan right now um, with, with the positive sunny side uh, tomorrow in America will be brighter, the city on the hill, all those sort of things. That's what uh, she's painting right now. And she's doing it quite effectively. And Trump and Vance need to capture that same, we want to be in charge. Yes, we're going to be competent. And we are going to be that way in a way that is successful, in a way that is uh, a positive, in a way that moves America forward and is not just so negative all the time. John, you've already told us that Can your polls are not... Here, yeah, go on quickly, John. Yeah, because this is really relevant to uh, Tarek's earlier point about J.D. Vance and the authentic inauthenticity that he's been displaying. The thing that is impressing me about Kamala Harris right now is that she is not disowning the fact that she is part of the Biden administration. She is uh, uh, owning... Up to that, she's not changing her, her stripes at all, but she's moving forward. Uh, and that, I think, is a very powerful theme in and of itself. I'm not moving backward, but I'm also not going to be inauthentic and lie and say, hey, look, I didn't have anything to do with gossip. I didn't have anything to do with inflation. And I think that's impressive. And so far, I think she's getting away with it in a good way. OK, Tarek, if, uh, let if, me ask if you. If I could just interject real quick. Very, very I quickly, Mark. Reason that she's, I think that the reason that she's getting away from that is she's not doing any interviews or any discussions one-on-one -on -one or any uh, forums with actual voters or with media. So she's allowed to talk from a teleprompter 
which is great. I would do it, too, if the media was not challenging me. I would put my candidate out there every day, fill up the teleprompter with good vibes and good feelings and Oprah Winfrey. But the difference is when it gets to the debate in September and for the next two plus months, I don't think she's going to get that same carpet ride to victory. And I think the lack of interviews is increasingly going to become an issue. Tarek, as a Democrat, as you heard from John, his polls and everyone else's polls shows it's still very, very tight. What do you think could go wrong? What are you most worried about? What keeps you up at night? Is the problem that could, could be a skeleton in the closet, some, something that someone hasn't found out about Harris or Walsh? Could it be a major financial problem for the US? Or could it be an international crisis? Putin does something unpredictable with regard to Ukraine. Or, of course, the issue that you've been focused on, Gaza. What worries you most? I mean, I, I think at the forefront of all of our minds is the dangers to American values and American interests when it comes to the possible regional escalation. I think we've already seen horrific violence in Gaza. We've seen Palestinians continue to suffer. And unfortunately, the real risk, especially in the next two and a half months before an election, is that Netanyahu gets a little bit worried that his buddy Trump isn't going to win the election and he's got to sway uh, sway things a little bit more by escalating. And I think that's really dangerous for American lives. I think the reality is that we need a ceasefire. We need a permanent end to this violence, not just for Palestinians, which are suffering more than any of us could imagine. But we also need to make sure that we don't create dangers across other countries and other borders and put Americans in danger. And I think that is up to President Biden and Vice President Harris. And the faster we conclude this uh, this nightmare that we've continued to witness, the less likely it will impact her candidacy. And frankly, we've seen polls from the Institute for Middle East Understanding just this week come out in battleground states in Georgia, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in states that will make the decisions on who will be president in November that say if President Biden and Vice President Harris can achieve a ceasefire, it will drastically improve the ability for voters, and not just Arab voters, not just Palestinian voters, but multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi-faith voters who cannot figure out why this violence, this genocide has come to an why it hasn't come to an end. In terms of her comments in the speech on Gaza, uh, Mark, uh, she did say that what had happened in Gaza was devastating, so many innocent lives lost. But at the same time, she says she will always, whatever, supply weapons to Israel. Isn't this the fundamental problem, not just with her, but with American policy for decades? America wants to be the peace broker, yet America says it's on one side. It can't be both, can it? I think that's the problem. I think it's the problem that that uh, diplomacy works on its own timeline and not on the American electoral timeline. That's a challenge that could be a, a problem as well if Iran and its affiliates attempt to do something drastic uh, in response to the killing of the Hamas leader or some other type of activity like that. I think it could be very, very dangerous. As well, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, worried about uh, Ukrainians making incursions into his country and launching some sort of a tactical, tactical nuclear uh, type weapon could be difficult. As well, China wakes up one day and says, you know what, America, uh, we need to put you on the defense. And they make some uh, movement on Taiwan. That and also the, possible, uh, the possibility of some sort of an economic problem. All of these things are, are a stew that's being stirred right now uh, we all hope, I think, as Americans, that none of these things happen. But we do know that our adversaries have a vote in this situation as well. John, just tell us on Gaza, how does this poll, how important is it in the polls? You, you know, interestingly, we're going to have a poll out next week that I did it in conjunction with my brother Jim that's very similar to what, uh, what Tarek was talking about earlier. The fact is that Americans want an immediate ceasefire. They want a, a path to humanitarian aid. They, in fact, are more likely to vote for a candidate who suspends aid to Israel. What's especially striking, however, is the uh, the generational gap. 
where Gen Z, those about 18 to 27 years of age, millennials, those uh, who take us into the to the early 40s are radically different than Americans who are in their, their mid to late 40s and older on this issue. They always have been, and I've been tracking them for about 20 years now, but in particular now on this issue of Gaza, this is a, 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 a make or break issue for young voters. And that's why, uh, you know, yesterday's speech uh, was not a white paper. It was not, a, 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 you know, an elucidation of a detailed policy. It was a philosophical direction. And if we take a look at what she said, she went a whole lot further than any other presidential candidate has ever gone in an acceptance speech on the issue of Gaza and Palestinians. OK, Tarek, um, she did say in that speech that her and Biden are working so the Palestinian people can realise their right to dignity, security, freedom and self-determination. She didn't say they should get a Palestinian state. You're a former insider. Do you see a difference knowing some of the Harris team uh, and her national security adviser and others and the Biden team? Do you see there's a difference potentially if she becomes president between Harris and Biden? Yes, absolutely. But just because I'm an insider doesn't mean that I am going to be able to communicate to the rest of the community that cares very deeply about this. She's the vice president. She is the candidate for president. And it's her obligation to ensure that she bolsters support within the party from people who have been Democrats their entire lives. And I do want to point out that when she said that line, particularly about self-determination, that uh, that received one of the largest applauses of the night. I think people are yearning for this. And I think people are excited about what could happen. And I don't think that we can discount the importance of achieving long-term peace and self-determination for Palestinians, however it does get achieved. Thank you very much, all of you gentlemen, for joining us. Our guests today were Mark Fifley, John Zogby and Tarek Habash. Coverage of the U.S. campaign continues all the way to Election Day. That's November the 5th on Al Jazeera. And remember, you can get full analysis on aljazeera.com. We want your comments and suggestions too. Post them on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or use X. Tweet to us. We're at AJ Inside Story. From me, James Bays, and the entire team here, please stay safe. Bye-bye for now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.